Thank you, Jeremy, for leading those songs for us. And looks like I might have left my presenter turned on up here, so hopefully it won't die on us halfway through. Psalm of Invitation is number uh, 603, Almost Persuaded. We want to encourage everyone to be not almost, but completely persuaded to obey the gospel as we looked at this morning, which sets the pattern for being a genuine Christian. Our text tonight is going to be taken from John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeks such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I've had a few people ask me, over time, what is it, Mike, that you do As for a living? What do you do? Well, a couple of things. One, you know that I'm a paper carrier for the Rome News Tribune, and I get up in the wee hours of the morning, and I'm, you know, the crazy person running around all over Chattooga County. Don't worry, you people in, uh, in Walker County are safe from my crazy driving. Um, however, I will tell you that we have carriers over here, too, um, and all of us drive the same. However... Uh, there's also something else that I've been doing for the last five and a half years, and that is I run a local game shop for the young people in Chattooga County. It's something that kind of keeps them busy, keeps them occupied, and you're probably saying, well, Mike, what's this got to do with our topic of being genuine? Well, one of the games that we used to play, and I say used to because we don't anymore, uh, we've retargeted and rebranded and we're bringing in Christian based games and Bible based games and uh, into the shop to replace all the other games but one of the games we used to play was this and it is a called a collectible card game all the cards are different and I remember when I first bought a pack of it back in 1993 that uh, and my dad said well what are you paying so much for pieces of cardboard for he said, you're paying $10 for a deck. You could go down the street and pay a dollar for uh, a deck of cards. It's, like, it's not quite the same thing. Every card is different. Uh, but I can see the point of view. However, uh, there are cards like uh, this one, for instance, that's worth $350 to $400. There are some worth $10,000 and on up. And the thing about this card is it's $350 to $400. If it were real, this one's not. This is a real card. Hard to tell from back there, isn't it? You know what? It's even harder to tell when you put them into these game sleeves that we have. And now you can't tell at all. Someone that's been playing these games for the last 25 years can tell. The cards are slightly slicker. The colors may be off. And we can tell. But it's only because we've handled the thing so much. But you put them into a sleeve like this, and it is very difficult to tell. However, that is also applicable to our lesson in the fact that fakes, fakes abound. It doesn't matter if it's in a collectible card game, whether it's a $100 bill that's been faked, and believe me, or, believe it or not, the government jumps on people now just as fact for, uh, just as fast for fake card games cards as they do money, because one can easily be turned into the other. You can produce a run of ten thousand fake, say, Black Lotus limited edition cards from 1993 that will run between seven and ten thousand dollars. And you could make a whole run of about 10000 for about $10,000. Now, you multiply 10000 by 7000 the low price, you get a lot of money. Now, it's ill-gotten money, isn't it? And it comes from fakes. And we're going to be talking about fakes. Fakes abound. Proverbs 15, verse 27. He that is greedy of gain troubleth his own house, but he that hateth gifts shall live. Now that word gifts would better be translated as bribes. Everybody I think knows what a bribe is. That's when you give money to somebody 
to look the other way or for something in return that you're not supposed to get, things like that. The greed of this world motivates those who would make fakes, both of collectible cards and also Christians. We had a very great lesson last Sunday morning. And this is another reason I kind of shifted this lesson to tonight. Because last Sunday morning, Lee and I were sitting in the booth there, and we were getting ready to record, and I looked down, and David is talking about being an authentic Christian. I showed Lee, I said, look, these were my, these were my lesson titles already, okay? I'm not ripping him off. I'm not, I'm not faking here. Uh, the, this is what was planned. However, uh, fake Christians, fake Christians are greedy. Like the rich man in Luke 12, 16 through 21. Turn over there. Luke 12, 16 through 21. You know, a fake Christian gives with no thought of return. Or a real Christian. Let me change that. Sorry. A real Christian gives with no thought of return. A fake takes without thought of giving. Luke 12, 16 through 21. And he spake a parable unto them, saying... The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Someone with the wrong mindset. Someone who is motivated by greed. Someone who sees those the cheap way through. Hey, I could do this and the gain would be huge. Yes, but would it be right? I could have all this grain stored up and I won't have to work for a long time. Who gave you that grain to begin with? Who was it that gave you that grain to begin with? It was God that gave the increase. The funny thing about these cards and money especially these days have you noticed our money these days has become increasingly more and more cartoon looking it looks like to me it looks like funny money these days it's got all these colors on it and it's got these holographic bands on it you know what that's for that's fraud protection that's to make it harder to copy now when these cards were made back in 93 they didn't start with a bunch of fraud protection in them. They pretty much had one thing. They had a blue core at the center. Now, to find out if you had a real card or not, you would take it and you would rip it. Oh, good. That was, that was a fake. <clears throat> I'd have been worried. It had a black core in it. But in 93, that was the only protection they had. Now... The fakes have come along. They actually have blue cores. It's hard to tell. The fakes from the real cards. And you might actually be sitting there thinking, well, is it really a fake if they're using the same process, right? Yes, it is because a limited number was stamped by the company and said, this is a real card. We only produce this many. Well, there's so many thousand more out there now. What do we do? we got to root out the fakes, find out what the fakes are. Same in the church these days. There are so many people saying, I'm a Christian. But are you really? Are you because, are you here because of the Lord? Are you here to worship God? Are you here to study His Word? Are you here to learn more about His will? Are you here because it makes you look better in the community? Are you here because... People expect it of you. If you're here because people expect it of you, you're here for the wrong reason. We're here to worship and serve our God. 
You know, God, much like the companies that are doing the printing of the money and the cards and everything, God uses fraud protection. And in Matthew 26, 73 through 74, he shows us one way he, show, he gives us fraud protection, and that's through speech. Now, I get tongue-tied a little bit. That's not what we're talking about. Speech, the way that we speak, what we say, the way that we say it, whether we are using love, whether we are using corrupt communication. Because if you use corrupt communication, let me tell you this, you are not following God's will. Matthew 26, 73 through 74. And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou also art one of them, for thy speech betrayeth thee. Okay, let's set the stage. What's going on? Jesus has been taken captive, all right? He has been taken to trial. And during all this, the, the disciples are kind of standing around like, eh, I'm not really with him. I just won't know what's going on like the rest of you guys. And then they start coming over to Peter and saying, you're one of the disciples. You're one of his followers, aren't you? Because your speech, the way you speak, betrays you. And somebody said, well, they were talking about his accent. Were they? Let's keep reading. Then began he to curse and swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. Peter did not speak like someone of the world. His speech wasn't filled with cussing and foul language up until this point. He began cursing and swearing. And they're like, oh, no, wait, <laughs> you're not one of those, are you? Just like the story that David told us last, last week about the lady with the bumper stickers and all the, the, the fish and everything on the back of her car. Your speech will betray you. One way or another, your speech is going to betray you. If you speak like the world, you're of the world and of your father Satan. If you speak like a Christian, then you're with Christ. All right. So first, fraud protection then is speech. Let's see. What do we have next? Oh, yeah. How about modesty? Now, David's been talking about this a lot lately. Why do you think David talks about this? Why do you think it is that David brings us these lessons on modesty? Why do you think it is that the elders request these lessons on modesty? Because it's running into hotter weather. And you know how I know it's running into hotter weather? I can tell you right now it is. One, because I'm sweating. And two, every fan in the place is going out. Every hand fan in the place is going out there. I see them. I kind of wish I had one sometimes, but I've got a vent, so I'm good. It's getting hotter. People are losing layers of clothing. People think, oh, I, I'm going to wear shorts. I'm going to wear, you know, something with no sleeves on it. I'm going to wear less and less and less until you're showing way too much. Modesty. We preach a lot, especially during the summer. The temperature outside does not dictate modesty. God's word dictates modesty. Walking around in shorts, no shirts on, or a bathing suit, that's modest. If you wear clothes that make someone turn their head and start thinking of you in an improper way, guess what? That's immodest. Christians are not immodest. Christians are to be as put in Philippians 4 and verse 8, pure. Whatsoever things are pure, think on these things. You know what? You're not going to meditate on something and not do it. Because part of meditation is putting it into action. We look at the world around us and we want to be more like it. And the children of Israel wanted to be more like the world around them too, didn't they? So many times they said... God, give us a king. He'd give them a judge. God, we want a king like the other nations around us. He gave them a king. Started out okay, and it went downhill quick, didn't it? Had some ups and downs through the history of the kings. 
Some of them were all right. But you know what? From the point that a king was appointed over them, things got rockier and rockier for the children of Israel. Being like the world around you, not a good thing, guys. I tell you this, the, uh, the uh, cruise that Kristen and I took Seth on for his graduation trip, We'd never been on one, and we were kind of wondering, well, we don't know if this is something that uh, we want to do or do in future or not, but uh, uh, people don't know how to dress. Right? They got no idea how to dress. They don't know how to, they have no idea how to be modest. And now, I will tell you something. My family and I turned some heads when we were on that ship because we weren't dressed immodestly. We were dressed normally. We were dressed as Christians would dress. We weren't walking around in a bathing suit. We weren't walking around in shorts to, uh, too high. We weren't walking around in shirts to not enough. Speech will betray you. Modesty is a key. It's one of the key fraud protections. And you know what? Immoral entertainment. And you say, Michael, don't you deal in entertainment? Yes, yes, I do. I deal in entertainment in my shop. And as I said, we're beginning to phase out a lot of things that uh, we had been doing. Because five, five and a half years ago when I opened my shop, we opened carrying all the collectible card games and everything, which don't need that card anymore. We opened carrying all those, and as I learned, and as I grew, and as I studied, I realized that these things may not fit in with God's plan for things. So immoral entertainment. Okay, here we go. This will fit also in with Philippians 4 and verse 8. Whatsoever things are pure, think on these things. Well, if it's not pure, how about we stay away from it? How about that little saying that... Uh, Went around a few years ago, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Well, what would Jesus do? Would he sit down and play one of these games to get people in, to talk to them, and fellowship with them? Entertainment is one way of bringing youth to us these days. But it's not what we should be about. I have seen churches that did not have a pulpit so much as a stage, stage lighting, and a band, and it looks like a rock show. It literally looks like a rock show. Everything from the lighting to the pyrotechnics, and you don't need that. You need the Word of God. Because all the pyrotechnics in the world aren't going to dwell in you richly. The Word of God will, the Spirit will. Moral entertainment, Psalm 101, verse 3. I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. Think about the effect that entertainment has had on our world. No, I'm not going to blame video games for all the school shootings. I will tell you they haven't helped. There's no way they've helped. Do I blame them? No, not directly. You say, well... It's not wicked. It's not innately evil. Okay? Let's look at the better translation of that verse. You say, wait a minute. Wait, what? Better translation? Yeah, there's actually a better translation of the word wicked there. It actually translates out into English better as, let me get the correct word here. Oh, worthless. I will set no worthless thing in front of my eyes. Does there, is there any use in a game, say, like this? Is there an alternative? Yes, there is. There's plenty of alternatives. Actually, one alternative to uh, the first collectible card game that was put out back in 1993 was, came out just a few months later. It was called Redemption. It was a Bible-based card game, and a friend of mine, Rob, works on it, has been working on it since the beginning. He created it as an alternative to Magic the Gathering, which was the number one first collectible card game. It's been running and is still running and has been running now for 25 years. 
or more. Time slips away from me. <clears throat> there's no alternative. But you say, well, is it, does, is there any worth in it? Yes, there's worth in it. You might remember a lot of you from your Bible school days, uh, you may have gotten those cards that had a scene on it. And on the bottom it had your memory verse. These are much the same. They have artwork that ties in with the verse that's on the card, printed on the card, and can be used as a memory verse. And then there's a game effect on the card as well. And that game effect is also tied in with the verse and will make the players go, wait a minute, this does that. Why does this card do that in the game? Read the verse. Oh, that's why it does. There are all kinds of things that can be done with our entertainment. More about that in a little bit. But first, our fraud protection, our speech, our modesty, and immoral entertainment. If you're a Christian, you're not going to be into immoral entertainment. Let's keep going. Don't rip God off. What do I mean by that? Don't rip God off. Again, I started my business over five years ago. I didn't understand what the Word of God uh, and its teachings were talking about genuine Christians. I put worthless things in front of my eyes and said, I'm going to use this for God. I'm going to use this game for God. I'm going to bring people in so that I might be able to sit and speak with them. And it's worked to some degree. But you know what? I think it worked to a better degree and to more effect if I was focusing the games that we were carrying in my shop upon the Bible. So while we've had some success, I think the success would increase if we put our focus on to God. Don't kid yourself. Uh, don't be taken in by sin. Don't rip off God. If you love God... You will keep his commandments, and we are to be worshipers in spirit and in truth. You remember our text. We are to be worshipers in spirit and in truth. Good brothers and sisters, you can tell with what spirit something is made and whether you should put it in front of your eyes. Uh, do not waste your time on worthless things. Is there any worth in something that you're doing? Let's say I'm button mashing. Yeah, that's what I call video games and and mobile games because honestly that's what it is to me so if you're button mashing are you is there any worth in it and again I'm not saying that video games are inherently evil I am saying think about it take pause before you invest all your time and energy into it is there any worth in it is there any spiritual worth I have friends that have spent Hundreds upon hundreds of hours playing video games, sitting at a screen, looking at it, and usually yelling at it and throwing things at it whenever things don't go their way. Sometimes throwing the controller or the keyboard, flipping a table. Is there any worth in it? Don't waste your time on worthless things. Replace those things. How about that? How about we replace those things? How about you take the app that's taking all your time? I don't care if it's, it's fantasy football. I don't care if it's Fortnite. I don't care if it's Minecraft. I don't care what it is. Take that app. Delete that app. Put on a Bible study app. You can smile and laugh for a while. But when this life is over and you add up the worth of your time, and how you spin it, you'll realize that you didn't spend your time as wisely as you'd hoped. Now, the older you get, and heaven help me, I'm actually looking at my 40th birthday coming up in October. <clears throat> the older you get, the more you start thinking about eternity. And you say, well, I'm young. It doesn't really matter to me right now. Okay, well, maybe it should because you're not guaranteed another hour another minute how much time have you wasted so take the app that takes so much time install a bible study app 
Install something that can help you grow spiritually. Turn off the TV shows that give you nothing spiritually in return. Turn on GBN for a while. There's some great teaching going on on GBN. You say, oh, Mike, that's boring. Is it? Is it really? When you dig into the Word of God, when you find out what God has in store for your life, the fact that it sets you free to step out and speak to anyone. I remember not long ago, there were letters and messages flying to the to the White House from Christians all across the nation because of abortion. And they were being sent in red envelopes. Well, the White House knew exactly what it was when it was coming in because this is from Christians saying that this is another life that's been taken. Has it helped? Maybe it has. Some of the abortion laws are being done away with. Some things are being put into place to protect human life. Turn off the worldly music. Turn on something with a good spiritual message to it. You say, but I like my country music. I like my rock and roll. I like my rap. I like my R&B. I can go on forever because there's a hundred different, more than a hundred different genres of music. But you know what? There's actually that many genres of music that might actually have a spiritual message to them as well. Remove the games from your life that don't spiritually uplift you and play something together with your family and friends that point to Christ. You know, we've got tons of games. And yes, I understand that there are a ton of board games and card games out there that are Bible-based. Okay, they're regular games that have been reskinned. Uh, Bibleopoly. Oh, save me from awful Bible-based games. That's something that a lot of designers are actually looking at now. They're trying to reconcile their faith with their hobby and trying to figure out how can I actually utilize my skills and bring people to Christ? How is it that I can make a game and also uphold the teachings of Christ? Something that can be used at BBS, something that can be used as an outreach tool, something that can be used in Bible school, something that can be used as an incentive. And more and more good Bible-based games are beginning to turn up. Of course, I think that has something to do with the fact that more and more tabletop games are being made these days because people found out there's money in it. But you'll notice that the more and more Christian tool, tools that are put out there, their prices aren't necessarily what you would expect of a premium game. For a premium tabletop game, you'll pay about $90. Now, that's a game that you'll take out and you'll play over and over and over. But again, it's a $90 step. That's a lot to take in right there. It's not Monopoly. $12 down at Walmart. But at the same time, it's something that you can use as you're in your family outreach. You can have a game night. Invite your neighbors over. And they're like, hey, what's this about? It's about the Bible. But don't worry, you'll have fun playing it anyway. Don't rip God off. Don't delude yourself into thinking that sin can be used for God's glory. Be genuine Christians. You know, I absolutely love it. Uh, Brother Marshall Keeble used to say that we're fruit inspectors. <laughs> love it. Matthew 7 and verse 20. You inspect the fruit of those around you. You say, oh, you're not supposed to judge. Tell me where that's said in the Bible. You're going to say Matthew 7. Is that about right? Judge not that you be not judged. How about you continue on? Judge not that you be not judged, for wherewith what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. I'm fine with that. I judge by the word of God. I judge a righteous judgment. I'm absolutely fine being judged by that. Are you? 
So people that say, you can't judge me. Yeah, actually you can. And you can also inspect their fruits. What is it they're turning out? What is it they're turning out in their life? You can see what a person has produced. You can see if that person is bringing people to Christ. You can see if that person is producing speech out of their mouth that is fit for the kingdom of God. Or if they're producing corrupt communication. You can tell by their Facebook posts. You can tell by their tweets or their Instagram or Snapchat or uh, all that social media garbage. There's so much that you can inspect now. A person really can't hide in the 21st century. You're known. And you say, oh, I have a right to privacy. Really? These days? You think so? No, you don't. Your fruits, just like your speech, betrays you. They tell who you're following. You know there's only two paths. There's that big, wide path. It's easy to go down. It's easy to walk down. It leads to destruction. The whole world's going down it. Then there's that squiggly little, it says straight path in the Bible. Let me clarify that. That straight means dangerous, not necessarily straight. I say squiggly and small because as a newspaper carrier, I, I go up squiggly little small back roads all night long. They get you where you plan on going. But boy, it can be dangerous getting up those things. Same with the life of a Christian. It can be dangerous getting to our eventual goal, but you know what? The end's worth it. Be fruit inspectors. Look at one another. Not to berate one another, but because... We love one another and we want to get to heaven. That's our goal, to get to heaven together. If there's something wrong in my life, I want to be told. If there's something wrong in your life, I will, with the most love I can, tell you that it's not up to what the Bible says and it needs to change. That's why I'm up here today. The elders, thank you so much, allowed me this opportunity to come up and preach. I'm up here to try to help, to try to tell you the shortcomings I've had. Hopefully you can avoid them, and maybe you can identify some shortcomings in your life. Maybe your fruit isn't what it should be. It's easy to detect fakes. John 3, 20 and 21. Let's see, do I actually have that one printed out here? <laughs> Uh, guess what? We're, we're going to have to um, pick up the Bible here and turn to John 3. Fortunately, I'm breaking in a new Bible, but it is thumb-tabbed. John 3 and verse 20 and 21. Uh, unfortunately, it's red on white, so it's going to be difficult for me to read. For everyone that doeth evil hath the light, uh, hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth come to the light, and his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. You know the interesting thing about uh, fakes? If you put them under a strong light source and examine them, they usually don't stand up. Have you ever noticed that you hand a... $20 or more bill to somebody these days. They're even doing it with $5 bills, I think, now. You hand them a $5 or more bill, and a lot of stores are turning around, putting it under this ultraviolet light and making sure it's real. I was in, uh, what was the store? Hobby, Hobby Lobby the other day. And I paid for some chalkboards for my shop. And they took my $20 bill, turned around, and put it under a light checking to see if it was real. If you want a strong light source, Jesus Christ is a strong light source. The Bible is a strong light source. God is a strong light source. That light will shine into your life and let you know where the fakes are coming in. And they will let everyone know 
whether you're a fake or a true, genuine Christian. That light, it shines on our deeds and shows whether they should be reproved. Oh no, look, I did have it printed. There it was on the next page. Are you genuine? Don't trick yourself into thinking just because you can walk around in the light of day. This is the 21st century. A lot of people walk around in the light of day saying, I am righteous, I am holy. And yet, they're not living according to the word of God. If you are not living according to the word of God, you are not righteous. You are not holy. And I am not making the judgment there. The word of God is making the judgment. Don't trick yourself into thinking just because you can walk around in the light of day it means that you're okay with God. It probably just means that brethren have been too soft-hearted with you and haven't told you the honest truth to look at yourself. I want you to do that now. I want you to look at yourself. I want you to look at yourself in the light of the fruit that you bear for God. I want you to look at yourself in your manner of speech, the entertainment that you put into your life, the communication that you have with people around you, does it show that you are a genuine Christian? Does it show that you're just faking it while we stand, while we sing?